All right. So we're talking about the beautiful mind. The beautiful mind. Who has watched that movie, The Beautiful Mind? I'm sure you have. You have watched that movie, The Beautiful Mind. The Beautiful mm -hmm. Mind. The Beautiful Mind. Yes. How many times have you <laughs> watched that, The Beautiful Mind? Oh, man. No, with anybody. <laughs> yes. Twice. Twice. That's it? Yeah. Well, you need to watch it ten more times. How many times <laughs> have you watched once, the Once, but it was a while ago. while ago? The Beautiful Mind? Once. The Beautiful Mind? Yeah, but once or twice. Once or twice. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. So, so what's the take-home message of The Beautiful Mind? Oh, it's a movie review, not a... It's been so long <laughs> since I've seen it, I can't even yeah. remember. Whatever you remember. Not much, honestly. Yeah, what do you remember? Anybody? Like Matt Damon. What's that? Is that who's in it? Matt, uh, who's in it? Mark Russell Crowe. Russell Crowe. Crow. Uh, Crow. I don't yeah. know, obviously. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, um, I think it's probably about a patient who has some sort of psychological illness. Mm -hmm. um, schizophrenia would be my guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is schizophrenia, yeah. 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 Anything else come to your mind regarding the movie? It's mathematics. It's I'm like sorry? A lot of yeah, equations right. and formulas mm -hmm. in his head. Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. So he had a lot of equations and things, you know. So what do you remember? What do you remember much about that? I remember seeing the room that was covered, uh, mm -hmm. covered in equations and was it sticky notes, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. post-it notes all over the place. Mm -hmm. And the window pane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so we kind of established the person who had that was had a schizophrenia the disorder. Mm -hmm. What was the other attribute about that individuals? Mm -hmm. Successful life. He's attending you, like uh, an Ivy League school at the time. Attending an Ivy League school, right? You know, and he also then earned what in his profession? Uh, college degree. College degree, and I think that he may have also earned a Nobel Prize or not, if my yes. mind's mm -hmm. yeah, Nobel Prize in was it the math or physics? Uh, whatever his, I think it was in physics. In physics, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the beautiful mind really kind of illustrates the point: a person can have a very severe psychiatric condition, such as schizophrenia, but yet they can be very brilliant and bright in the other dimensions. Schizophrenia is the topic of our conversation today, uh, and I'm t I, I'm so very happy that the movie was titled "The Beautiful Mind," rather than another kind of thing to derogate the brain's capacities. You know, so we sometimes we kind of make it, you know, I mean, our, our myths about medicine uh, and, and the popular culture, anything which is neurological is wonderful. A stroke I can live with. Schizophrenia is shameful. You know? mm -hmm. It's such a sad thing. Depression is bad. Anxiety is bad and a sign of personality or a character flaw. But if I am having, you know, a headache is fine. Headache, I can call my boss and say, you know, I have a headache and I, I don't have to come. I would not call my boss and I'm feeling depressed today. You know, it would be very unusual. Or I had just had a panic attack and I cannot drive. You know? But we have to change that whole perspective so that we recognize the abilities of our brain software, which is where the psychology is, is as related to the biological conditions as is diabetes with insulin. So we have to kind of recognize that that perspective. Uh, I had the opportunity of actually seeing uh, this. Uh, this is depicted for a real person, actually, who lives in New Jersey. And so he came and spoke. I think Ken Nash is his name. And he came and spoke at American Psychiatric Association's annual meeting as a chief, uh, you know, as a, as a main speaker. So this, this, this beautiful mind is actually an actual person. Mm -hmm. uh, who lives in New Jersey, and, and, and it's his actual life story. So, so it's important. We, we talk here about our actual life stories. You know, schizophrenia is not somebody else's condition. It could be our my mom, dad, brother, sister, neighbor, uh, you know, somebody in my own family. Addiction is not somebody else's story. It's our story. So sometimes we distance ourselves from these conditions, but we have to recognize alcohol dependence is not somebody else's story. It's, it's our story. It's my story. It's our community's story. So within that perspective, let's talk about schizophrenia and, and kind of at least highlight when do we diagnose with somebody who has schizophrenia? What, is the, what are the criteria set? So they have to have symptoms to be diagnosed with schizophrenia. It's a six-month period, and they're showing symptoms for at least one month. And there are certain things you look for, such as hallucinations, delusions. Um, you can have the negative symptoms, such as like a flat affect or like your mood is kind of down. Um, things like that that mm -hmm. you kind of need to look for in order to diagnose it. Okay, so tell me more symptoms. 
Um, there are also cognitive symptoms, mm -hmm. um, difficulty functioning, working memory, um, difficulty being in your normal environment to the point where you, you've lost your typical functioning. Okay. okay, so loss of functioning due to cognitive mm -hmm. difficulties mm -hmm. can happen. And the positive signs were? Some like bizarre, dis um, what's the word I'm looking for? Behaviors. Okay. Like their okay. behaviors are a little bit odd or what you, not what you would really consider. Okay. And, and what is, what is, what's underneath that bizarre behavior? What kind of thoughts are going on or, or yeah, difficulties is going on in the like brain? Paranoid thoughts. Maybe. Paranoid thoughts, you know. Um, the like disorganized thoughts. Okay. Okay. Um, so that's good. What else can happen? Hearing voices. Hearing voices. People. What are the most common kind of voices that people may hear? Sometimes they'll say, um, well, that goes along with the paranoid also, but somebody is telling them to do something or um, somebody's trying to overtake their mind and okay. point it in a certain direction to do a certain thing. Absolutely. Demonic so here, voices. Demonic voices, voices which may be command in nature. Mm -hmm. So what are the different kinds of hallucinations? You know? And when we say the word hallucination in psychiatry, what does that mean? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. We have auditory hallucinations, okay. which are more closely associated with schizophrenia, schizophreniform yes. disorder, versus visual hallucinations that we more frequently see with people in delirium uh, mm -hmm. or even in states of dementia. Wonderful, uh, wonderful. It's very important to differentiate these two because even the kinds of hallucinations can give you awareness of which disease are we looking at? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so what other hallucinations we can have? We can also have olfactory or uh, tactile sensation, mm -hmm. uh, sensation type, mm -hmm. uh, that are considered hallucinations also. Okay. So, give me an example for that. So, uh, formication, or mm -hmm. uh, not to be confused with fornication, but formication mm -hmm. uh, is a sense of feeling things uh, crawling on the skin, which is uh, oftentimes associated with. Uh, acute psychosis secondary to cocaine uh, use. Okay. Cocaine use. So it becomes even more, uh, you know, as you may have seen, Jim, and in your in your pra practice, people may come in with your various tactile difficulties, including skin, something is crawling under my skin, and those types of, you know, kind of yes. symptoms. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so cocaine is very common, but most, many stimulants can, can cause the same kind of stuff, you know. Um, uh, what are other uh, olfactory would be what? Um, I'm just going to shift. Smell, oh, like you're smell. smelling something that's not not there. Yes. Right? No. So, so all the senses that we have can have misperceptions. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, if you think of that, mm -hmm. no matter whether it's a smell or even the taste, you know, mm -hmm. can we can have taste something when it's not there? It's not a very common thing within the psychiatric perspective. We can have some neurological underpinnings, you know. Uh, um, but I mean, uh, I have seen people with um, um, certainly with the olfactory hallucinations, uh, quite a few, and then other with that, but I think most common are. So, so those are hallucinations. So even one symptom can be analyzed further to differentiate between what diseases it might represent, right? Mm -hmm. okay, as you know, Tyler and we are together trying to figure it out. So that's why when we are taking histories, we are always looking for presentations of their symptoms, right? So we talk about delusions and hallucinations and paranoia and disorganized thoughts. Uh, what else? Uh, so somebody said six months. Why six months? Because something that you have to differentiate is um, schizophreniform disorder, mm -hmm. which is less than six months. So schizophrenia is greater. It's a more chronic condition. Absolutely. So, so we shouldn't be casually diagnosing people with schizophrenia who have, happens to have a psychotic symptom that could be uh, some of the psychotic symptoms gems can be from what conditions? They can be from uh, specific phobias, uh, mental retardation, uh, malingering, uh, somatization. Mm -hmm. yeah, some other medical condition. It can also be uh, secondary to depression yeah. uh, and that's an important one to distinguish uh, schizoaffective disorder versus uh, major depressive disorder with psychotic features. Absolutely. So again back to the idea of history taking and, and establishing a timeline. Absolutely. It's, uh, histories are so very missed. Um, I was l listening to a TED, TED lecture where one of the speakers and I, f I would not name could not remember his name, so I would not mention that, except that his, his point was, we have lost the art of even sitting down with a patient, hearing them out. 
Okay. And then, so we are we are kind of reawakening that art of hearing people, listening to their stories, listening to their symptoms, because they really are telling us what an MRI cannot tell us. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a functional. It's a functional MRI. That means it's their, their stories are functional rather than on the picture, right? I mean, we can hear them, and who would know them better than patients themselves? You know, they know their symptoms and difficulties. Um, and he'll think, well, you know, that now the present day healthcare, um, uh, you will often see when we were trained, and I remember we would, we would have our grand rounds and conversations around patients. You know, we would come around and there's a patient and we'll come down and I will present my history and the professor or the attending would actually have, we will have a live conversation where the patient is in the middle and, and obviously we would be able to then check out those things and now we see the labs are seen first, uh, you know, we are, we are, we are talking to the, all these x-rays and things and then we go and talk to the patient if that. <laughs> now we already have come up with a conclusion and then we listen to somebody's story and I'm not saying everywhere but it's a very common thing to hear people not talk around an x-ray, mm -hmm. you know, or around an MRI, around a lab but not around a person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we want to kind of come ourselves, bring ourselves around a person again, that's where the whole stories unfolding and then have those secondary things as part of validating what we think it is rather than being the precursor. So uh, uh, depressions, other, what other conditions can mimic, mimic like schizophrenia but are not? Yeah, um, substance abuse, substance abuse, um, brain tumor, any brain sort tumor. of neurological um, Fantastic, issue. neurological issues, thiamine deficiency can cause that. Oh, hello. Vitamin deficiency can cause psychosis. Mm -hmm. uh, use of alcohol and post-alcoholic recovery, people can have all these various symptoms, uh, you know, um, of, of what, what could appear like psychosis, but really is not schizophrenia, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So we have made a differential diagnosis between medical conditions, between psychiatric conditions, and some psychological conditions, you know, as you highlighted. So how do we treat? Yeah, oh, how, how common is schizophrenia worldwide? Mm -hmm. Incident, one percent, mm -hmm. all around the world. So no, everybody gets gifted. <laughs> <laughs> you can live in Ukraine or Del Monte; doesn't really matter. <laughs> one percent of the population will have schizophrenia, um, and we really don't. What, what what causes schizophrenia? There's a hypothesis that there's some sort of genetic basis. Okay. Um, friends and families, but nobody's really very clear on what what the real cause is. Okay, so if you find one, you will be the next <laughs> Nobel laureate. <laughs> but there's a lot of research and about the infection theory, the theory of, you know, genetic. Um, they used to call that uh, schizophrenic, schizophrenogenic mothers, uh, that a schizophrenic mother will have a schizophrenic child, and they said it's mother who caused that disease which really was not the case, but we people would observe, you know, that there is a higher incidence of, uh, if there's a mother uh, has condition, there's a higher incidence of, I think it rises up to 30 or 40 percent. If the both parents are rather up to 80 percent or something, it's a very high incidence of, mm -hmm. so genetics plays a role, but we really don't know which and how and, and so forth. And, and so treatments, how do we treat? We'll so, start with somebody who is an expert in treatment here and then we'll get into a doctor. <laughs> So you would use like psychotherapy, um, okay. definitely talking to somebody, and then the antipsychotics. Okay. So you, what what kind of psychotherapy you might use? Um, you could do like group therapies or individual therapy, counseling type things. Okay. What would you say? So I am Mr. Jones, who was recently diagnosed with schizophrenia. What would you tell me? The congratulation, Mr. Jones. You would just, you know, ask what's what type what type of symptoms they're having. I told you, and you already made the diagnosis. Mm. Now you're a therapist working with me. Mm. It's a very good question. Isn't that a good question? <laughs> 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 what would you do, Kimberly? Um, I I think I agree. Some type of behavioral therapy, or um, like being able to redirect the thoughts and um, okay. valid validate that they're actually not true. Okay, that's good, that's good. So so they will say, Are you, do you think I'm lying? <laughs> well, that's a tricky question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to get you into this conversation, but what, what would you do if somebody has schizophrenia? You don't have a clue what to do with them, what would you do? Well, I wouldn't say that they were lying. Um, I, I 
agree with what has been said already. Because you would say, no, that I love you, but I don't know what to do. I'm just teasing. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Maybe so you. Right, but you said uh, you, you're validating them, understanding them. Yeah. That's what you yeah. really are saying. Mm -hmm. okay, so what else would you do? What kind of therapy? What type of therapy? Well, first of all, the the importance of maintaining a safe and trusting environment. Very good. Get, getting involved, family support, family therapy is very yeah. important. Okay. Uh, reassurance, uh, keeping them on their medication, reality testing. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. That's very good. You covered a lot of things. You were going to say something. Only that, you know, there's nothing more important, beating this poor dead horse, but uh, of, of overall wellness and well-being. Sure. So besides ensuring the safety of, of the patient initially and, and to make sure that you have the supports there of not under uh, underplaying the, the role of diet and exercise and getting plenty of sleep, and then from there building an idea of what you do if you're in, a, in an uncomfortable situation. Make the patient feel empowered uh, and I think along the lines of... And that's important. How, wh what do you think they are feeling at that time? Well, I think that just like in any, any uh, disease state that we deal with, we can never know for certain, sure. but both in encouraging the patient to describe to you what what the patient's feeling is also teaching the patient to be more empathetic for others that are around. So something that I often do with patients that I see uh, uh, is no matter what condition it is, and I, I usually view, view medical and psychiatric illness as an artificial division uh, because of the interdependence, but of encouraging them to think about others the same way, mm -hmm. that we don't know what others are, are going through. You know. Absolutely. So people are fearful when they're diagnosed with a condition which is as severe as difficult. Mm -hmm. So your point of bringing some comfort in their life, understanding in their life, that's what you have a duty to is very important. Uh, and, and, and generally we call them supportive therapy. That's what you were describing. And I'm just going to give it a label. So we support them. That's not the time to confront yet because um, it's not there's a time and place to just build their boundaries and help them feel okay before we do a lot of reality orientation and things of that nature. So because at a psychodynamic level, we believe that a person's abilities to focus on their own ego structures is not there. So we become almost like their external ego structures. You know, we give them support. We give them guidance, and then we just leave it at that. You know, and after you have inter instituted treatments such as medications, antipsychotics, mm -hmm. and there are hundreds of different treatments that we can implement in the medicinal domain. Uh, but treatments are very effective. Uh, people do get better. Antipsychotics, uh, we are very fortunate. We have very new, wonderful antipsychotics that can be used for for many of these conditions. Um, so people can have fulfilling, enriching, enriching life. Um, uh, medicines here play a significant role, I must emphasize, mm -hmm. a very significant role before we knew everything else but we didn't know the medicines and here's one of those biological dimensions of psychiatry where medicines have helped tremendously in deinstitutionalizing people who used to be in state hospitals in thousands. Uh, from 5,000, 4,000, they were, they were living quarters, uh, living lives, now to maybe 200 and 300, you know, so, and, and very few people need longer term care, but, but, but many people get better by medicines then, but Tyler was also mentioning, you know, other aspects of care. Uh, I was surprised and stunned that people, once they're in a good space of their uh, active symptoms under better control, they really are engaged in learning a lot more. Uh, I had a patient, and I'll finish up by that. Uh, we start yoga in a hospital, and he used to come in and, and do yoga. And, and he had one of the sweetest form of schizophrenia. And I asked him, why do you, why do you even come in and do yoga? He said, now my, when my voices come in, I'm able to shrug my shoulder and let them go. You know? For him, he had developed the anafrontal cortex capacity of mindfulness that when the voices would come, rather than getting engaged, he was able to let them go through. And he also noted, you know, that he just felt more relaxed and calmer. So he did that anyways. And so there's, there's a same thing to be said about uh, other ways to help people besides purely medicinal sciences uh, to alleviate the difficult symptom. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. So on that note, we'll kind of wrap up the session of uh, psychotic thinking processes, um, schizophrenia in particular. 
Um, and uh, we'll pick up the topic, the next topic as well. What have we not done, you ladies especially? Mm -hmm. uh, we have done anxieties, obsessional anxiety, depression. depression. We did substance abuse. Eating, substance abuse. Disorders. eating disorders. Eating, eating disorders. Disorder. We have done that or not done that? We have not done that. Eating disorders. So we'll do eating disorder next time. And we'll give it a flavor of um, uh, what kind of people we should hang around so that we don't develop an eating disorder. <laughs> 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 so our environment and eating disorders would be the topic. And we'll just make it more accessible in everyday life. And on that, on that note, we'll do a little call to action. OK. All right, if you enjoyed this, you can learn more by visiting us at seclair.com or subscribe to Seclair Video on YouTube uh, for more videos like these. And you can also follow us on Google+. Plus. Join us live Mondays at the noon hour so you can ask questions for us to answer during our discussion as well. Thank you. Thank you. This was a statement that we were involuntarily asked to read <laughs> by Mike. <laughs> thought, thought insertion. I thought insertion. Yeah. This is part of schizophrenia. I believe. Talks, thoughts come from somebody. This was Mike. The thought came into our brain. But thank you, Mike and uh, Omer, for being our technology gurus to make us available to the world which is beyond us. It's called unseen world of internet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.